Welcome everyone and thank you for those who are joining online and those who will be watching later and those that are here. Um, like I said last week and as we were going through on Wednesdays we're going to be teaching on uh, order and authority and we're going to kind of rip it apart a little bit and the first part of this today is just kind of getting a grip on what most of us already know but there's a number of people out here who are completely unaware of how the church is supposed to be set up. You know, you would think that you could just believe the leaders that are in your church and you just, hey, this is the way it's supposed to be set up. But all they did was go with the flow. They went with the flow and it, it's, it's outside of what God truly wants. And, and we're going to examine some of this stuff and see what God truly wants for this day and for this hour for His people and the way He wants it set up, the way He's always wanted it set up. So let's go to prayer real quick and then we're going to get into this and, and talk briefly about uh, what God wants done. Father, we come before you this day and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your scripture. We thank you for the examples and examples that are within it so that we can run our lives according to it and run your ways according to it and bring it down to the face of this earth, Father, and implement it here. Perfect order, Father, the way that you want it set up, the way that you want things structured within our lives so it all flows because without it, we know there's nothing and without you, we know there's nothing. Right now, we take authority of, you, of darkness any spirit that will try to rise itself up against this, and we bind it in Yeshua's name, and what's bound on this earth is bound in heaven itself. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So like I said last week, I, I'm very much a stickler when it comes to the things of order and authority, and it's one of the first key things that jumps out at me personally. Um, I'm always looking for it, because if it's outside of order of what God has said, then it, it doesn't mean anything. It's wrong. And that's, that's the first sign of, of, of anything. You know, where's it coming from? Who's bringing it forth? You know, if, it, if there's somebody sitting in the congregation and they're going to start prophesying for the nations, well, right away, the first thing you've got to do is, who are you? And it's out of order. And you know that it's out of order, and you know that it's wrong, and it can't be of God. And, and right there, at that point in time, you just cut it off. And it's one of the first things that I use personally to vet things is to see, is it in God's order? Because the first thing that God ever did, and you're going to hear me repeat this over and over and over, the first thing that God ever did was set things up, set the order up, even in heaven itself. So if we go to Luke 21, 8, uh, 21 28, and these things began to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, let's read that out of the CJB, the complete Jewish Bible. When these things start to happen, stand up and hold your heads high because you are about to be liberated. You see, what is going on today is that we've got an entity out here, and we'll call it the church for the next few weeks. We've got an entity out here that is absolutely desperate, desperately seeking for the absolute truth. And this is where we come up with 2,300 different sects of Christianity because people are searching out for the truth. But they don't know which way to turn. They don't know where to go. They don't know what, what's right and what's wrong. And it comes down to the final authority, which is the Word of God. And again, it's very difficult when you're looking at the Word of God and you don't see the Word of God and the way that God structured things out here within your average assembly, your congregation, your average ecclesia. You don't see it sitting there. You don't see God's proper order sitting there. And we're going to get into all of that stuff. We'll get into the fivefold ministry and that's down the road in probably about three weeks more so when we get into some detail about that. But they're, they're, they're lost. And they, they kind of wander around and just kind of, they're the ship that's floating around and it, it's got no rudder on it. It's got no steering wheel in a car. Imagine driving down the road and you don't have a steering wheel in your car. All you have is a brake and an accelerator. Well, what good would that do you? What good would that do you? You'd crash. And that's exactly what's happened because the rudder the rudder of the whole thing with order comes down to the rudder is the prophets. We are the steering wheel. We are the direction. That's where the direction comes from. It comes from the prophets. The governance will come from the, from the apostles. The teachers, that's kind of obvious. They're going to teach into the things that the prophets bring forth is what they're supposed to be doing. And then you have your evangelists. They go out there and, hey, a couple verses, and they can go out there and they can run wild with it. But the whole thing got absolutely sideways when people didn't really want to hear what the prophets had to say anymore. And this is where it got out of, out of whack. And they kicked him out of the churches. So let's go to Revelation 3.14. 
Revelation 3.14. Now, when I say they kicked him out of the church, churches, I mean that they told him that they weren't welcome, don't come back anymore. And they closed the door and said, don't come back anymore. And they, they literally kicked them out of the churches. Why? Because they didn't want to hear the correction. And they didn't want to hear the harsh correction. And that's where that comes from in that office. But that office, even though it is the rudder, we're going to look at something today that's going to be maybe a little bit interesting to you about what office actually leads, even though it comes through the prophetic and the prophets. Revelation 3.14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the, of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. Would thou work uh, cold or hot? So that because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now you can drink a hot coffee, and now they have these, what, iced cappuccinos out here, and you can drink cold coffee. Same with tea. You can have hot tea, you can have cold tea. The thing you don't like, most people don't like, is just when it's like a lukewarm, and you kind of, eh, I don't want that. You're either going to put it in the fridge and cool it off, or you're going to heat it up, and that's where God wants you to. Why? Because when you're cold, He can do something with you. When you're hot, he's already got you and you're already doing the things for him. When you're lukewarm, you know that you're, what you're supposed to be doing and you're just not getting it done. And that's one of the things that uh, uh, goes on with the lukewarm. And you can't be lukewarm. It's, it's one of the things that God will just spew you right out of his mouth. He doesn't want anything to do with it. To know and to do not is what? Sin. Revelation 3.17 Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have no need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Because thou sayest, I am rich. I got everything that I need. Thank you, thank you. I got everything I need. And you know what? And in all reality, this is what the church is doing. They think that they've got everything that they need. But they don't even realize that they're the ones that's being spoke of here, which are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. A lot of this stuff will take you right back even into the Garden of Eden. You start talking about the naked. Obviously, they were poor. They didn't have anything. They didn't have pockets to put anything in. Wretched? Were they miserable? Well, I'm sure they were miserable on the way out. But again, what happened? Went into the wilderness, and that's where the church has gone. The church went into the wilderness where they had to do all this work, and then they got it all screwed up and got it all sideways, and it'll get put back in place. It'll get put back in place. But right now what needs to happen is God needs to take out a big bulldozer, dig a big hole, and push the whole thing right in and start over again. Because it's completely out of what he had ever set up. Revelation 3.18 I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried by the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. What do we right back to the Garden of Eden here? And anoint thine eyes with eye salve. What's that talking about? That's talking about the anointing that thou mayest see. You see, what's he he's speaking to Holy Ghost filled Laodicean church here? And he's saying that hey, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And that's what I'm trying to explain to everybody here over the next few weeks is that there's something wrong out here and it needs to be corrected. It needs to be put back in place. It needs to be put back the way that God wants it set up. Because outside of it, God can't bless that. Outside of His order, outside of the way that He structured things, He can't bless it. He can't bless anything outside of His Word. Especially when He tells us how to do something, how He wants something done, or He's given us examples, or examples, as I opened up in prayer about, and then we turn around and we create our own examples, our own examples, and we try and push our own way that we want things done. And it doesn't work like that. And then you can go to the seminary schools and they teach you and they push you into that agenda. That agenda being what? Set it up this way, do it this way. It works, it functions through our human mind. And it has nothing to do with our human mind. It has everything to do with a living God up above. 319, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You see, right here, Jesus Christ is telling them that they need to be rebuked. They need to be chastened. He even tells them here, what? You need to repent. Why? Because it's out of order. 
They're away from the things of the Father. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down on my Father's throne, so that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You have the ability to have an ear to hear what God is saying to the churches for your life. Not to get up there and blast it off to everybody, but you need to hear from the Father. You need to hear for your walk, for your life. You need to hear what God wants for this day and for this hour. And that's the voice that we are supposed to be hearing. And we're going to hear that voice. You'll get it twisted up. You'll hear from familiar spirits. And you'll have to discern. You'll have to pull it all apart. You'll have to look at it. You'll have to examine it. You'll have to contact people. Because familiar spirits are real. Familiar spirits will whisper the things of the Father and, and try and emulate the Father. And what's it going to do? It's going to lead you off a path. You see, but we've got to assume today that through what we just read here, that this is exactly where the church is this day and this hour. Exactly the place where the Laodicean church is. And it's very easy to sit back and compare and you can see what's going on. It's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. God never intended for pastors to lead churches. They're supposed to shepherd the flock. They're not supposed to be what? Given the direction for God's people. They're not supposed to be setting up the governance for God's people. Those fall within appointed offices that the Father has put in place. But again, what do we do? Lifted up the rug and we kind of swept that part of it underneath, didn't we? Because that's the way that God has always done things. Let me ask you, when did He change? At what point in time did He change? And we went through all of that last week. I understand that. You see, but there's got to come a point in time where we have to start asking the hard questions. We have to start asking, is there any authority left in the charismatic church out here or the church out here? Is there any authority left out there? Let me tell you something. God appointed authority. God appointed authority. Through what? Office. Not people, not person. It's through the office. Is there anybody out here who has the ability to go out there and correct? Pastors don't have the ability to go out there and bring the harsh correction. They don't. We went through that a little bit last week. They don't have the audacity to tell somebody, hey, get your stuff and get out of here and don't ever come back because you're hurting the people. You don't see that happen. But at the same time, am I blaming this generation for it? No, I'm not. Am I blaming the last generation for it? No, I'm not. This goes back hundreds of years. And this system has, was brought in hundreds of years ago. And this is where it all comes from. And this is where it all gets wrong. But now we have people standing up behind pulpits, bringing confusion because we have different doctrines that are coming out. You know, like I say, 2,300 different sects of Christianity. It's just doctrine after doctrine after doctrine. A different way of doing things. A different way of doing things. A different way of doing things. Sometimes there's different ways of doing things that are okay. When it comes to the Word of God, there's one way. There's only one way that He wants to be worshipped. And people say, well, I don't like that. And I don't want to, I want to do it like this. Well, you're not the one being worshipped. You're not the one who wrote the book saying how his people are supposed to worship him. It's not up to you. It's not up to your opinion. Go be your own God somewhere else and worship yourself over there because you've made yourself an idol. And that's the problem what's going on out here is idolatry has run rampant through the church because everybody wants to do things their way and they forgot to look and said, say, what did our Father above want? How did he want his people led? Oh, maybe you should go out there and find those prophets that, kicked out, that you kicked out centuries ago and wouldn't let them in. 
Maybe they got something to say. Maybe they can save your backside. Maybe this isn't what God wants for this day and for this hour, just to tiptoe through the tulips. Maybe it's time for God's people to pick up. Maybe it's time for them to understand what's going on in the end times. Maybe it's time for them to understand what God is trying to get done. And I know you out there that are listening this day and this hour know this stuff. But it's not about you either. This goes on beyond us. And this is where we have to take this, is beyond us. But they don't know. They don't know. They're just going through the motions. They show up to service. They say hi to everybody. They grab their coffee. They, and then they just go through the motion. And what have they done? The church has become complacent. They've become complacent. They no longer have a voice. They no longer have an, and carry an authority. They can't even get legislation to stop coming against them because God is not happy with lukewarm. God wants it either cold so He can do something and the people realize that, hey, I'm cold. I need the love of God wrapped around me so I can warm up here. And they'll change. And that's what the hot or cold is all about. And then those that he has embraced in his white raiment, in his, what, flesh, you're warm with the love of God. But the ones who know it, and they just refuse to get in there, and they're a little bit chilly, but they're not quite, they're just lukewarm. No hope. No hope. You see, the thing is, is confusion is not of the Father. And when you have entities out here organizations out here bringing forth confusion. Get one person saying one thing, another person saying another thing. That's not of the Father. Somebody always has to be right, and there's always got to be somebody that's wrong in a situation. Sometimes they can both be wrong, I guess. But when it comes to the things of the Father, when there's only one right way, who wins? God? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14.3. 1 Corinthians 14.3 But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. You see, most of the church believes today, and they may not say it, but this is the way it goes on, is that as long as somebody stands up and the words are some type of an edification, exhortation, of comfort, then everything's okay over here in Zion. But guess what? It's not. It's not, not all is well in Zion. Because some of the stuff that needs to come forth is absolute correction. And correction has to come to the body. But that's a great concern. That's a great concern because even correction has to line up with the Scripture. Another thing that we have to look at too with correction and the way that things get dictated what about governing boards? I'm not telling pastors to go out here and fire your entire board right now when we get into this, but God never ordained boards to run His people. You will not find, you will not find any scriptural evidence towards any of that. God has always wanted His people run by counsel, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a few weeks. God has always wanted His people run by counsel. Moses had a counsel. David had people surrounded by, around him. And this is where even the ten came from. The ten are a council. I'll get into that a little bit deeper in a few weeks, exactly what some of that's about. But that's what it's all about. Because if the pastors want to go out here and they want to fire their board and get rid of them because it's out of order, then you better look out because they'll have to fire themselves too. Because they're out of order. Is that sad to say? Well, it's a reality of where we're at right now. Is it sad that it got to that point? Yeah, but no, again, don't blame them. They're still standing up there doing their best and bringing it forth. But when it's not chugging on all cylinders, it's going to be a little tough. It's going to be a little tough. And that's why things have gotten lukewarm. And from lukewarm, they go to cold. And then from cold, people go, ah, we've got to find something to get where things right. 
because this isn't working. At what point in time do people wake up and say, this isn't working like it did in the book of Acts? At what point in time? How, how far down the rabbit hole do you have to go before you realize that it's not working? You know, miracles. Use that one for healings, for an example. You know, this stuff is something that's common. It's supposed to be common. Do we take advantage of the Father in that and just bluff it off? No, it's not what I'm talking about. But there's so many people that have never seen God do anything because God, again, can't operate outside of His order. And when I say can't operate, you'll see an odd demonstration of it. But the consistency and the power of the anointing cannot operate the way that God expects it to, the way it did back in the book of Acts when things are sideways. But then again, they're kind of lost, aren't they? But that's okay. They can be found. They can be found. You know, just like those donkeys that were lost. Hey, it's okay. They're found now. Back in Samuel's day. Had to work a little bit of that in. You see, but there's so much out here. And there's so much head knowledge out here. Head knowledge. And if we kind of look at head knowledge, the way that they go and they get educated, anybody can gain head knowledge. You can go on the internet and gain head knowledge. The thing is, is about heart knowledge. And when your heart is set on doing things the way that God wants it done, you'll get a long way with the Father. You may run into a lot of road bumps in the, on the way because you're going to run into people who are going to disagree with you. But you have to know the material. You have to know the Scriptures in order to combat, to defend yourself at least. But head knowledge, what gets in with head knowledge? That's where egos come in. That's where pride comes in. And that's where all these things just seem to funnel in because they figured something out. And it comes down to what? It comes down to the heart. The heart trying to serve the Father to the fullest capacity, the way that God wanted to be served, the way that God wanted to be worshipped, the way He wrote it in the Scriptures that He wanted to be worshipped. And that's all we've got to do? It sure is. Just do what He asked us to do. Why does that seem to be such a hard thing to do? You know why? Because it's not mainstream media anymore. It's not the main. It's not the normal. And that's why it's difficult sometimes to get up here and start talking like this, because you're talking against the normal from a very low perspective with, a, what, thousand people around? Talking to, what, the Christian nation out here? Say a third of the world? Oh, it'll happen. It'll happen. You see, but because of all these things that we've had to look at, because of some of these things with boards, when we get into that, we have to really examine, is there somebody, is there an order that God wanted? Let me tell you something. God caused everything to work in an order. Everything to work in an order. And when we go through this divine order that I'm going to be talking about, you're going to see how this can work, and it does work, and some of these have it absolutely even better than the way it's set up in the, in the church. But you can see that this is going to work in the church the way that God set it up. It'll work in the military. And you can see the military's got a better handle on order and authority than the church does. You see that this is supposed to be in the government. You see, God wanted His people led a certain way. He wanted them even governed a certain way. You'll see that this will work in business. Somebody's got to be the decision maker. You know, you have a board. You can have a board and surround yourself. You look at corporations. I worked for a corporation for 23 years. They sat on a board, and the board makes decisions, and then that decision comes out, and this is what we're going to do. Why? Because they put everything together. All the pieces of the puzzle come together. And that board sits there in business. And it'll also work, and this is one po point in time that we're going to hammer this at the end of this series, which will probably be in about six weeks, about the home. This absolutely will run the home to God's perfection. 
And we're going to straighten some stuff out because some stuff is getting really loose. And my wife has been kind of on me lately because I'm starting to get a little bit ticked. I'm starting to get a little bit ticked because I'm seeing little things pop up here and there. And as we go through this, order and authority, it's going to be what? Trying to rise its head. It's always going to be there. And I've got to be on my toes for the next eight weeks now because the trying times are going to come. The testing comes. But the home's going to get put back in place. The home is going to get put back in place. And there may be some people that need to hear some stuff. But it's going to get put back in place in God's order. And so is ministry going to get put back in place in God's order all around the face of this earth. Because that's what God wants. You see, the order of the church. You see, it goes, it's God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That's the way that God set it up. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's not like one thing all up here. And now we're going to go through some scripture and we're going to prove that to you, that Yeshua, yes, He's part of the Father. He's part of the vine process, just as we are part of the Father through Yeshua, because we are part of that vine, press, uh, vine process as well. John 17, 8. Again, this is something that the church even screwed that one up. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. John 15, 1. You just write them down. You're not going to be able to flip to them. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. John 3.16, we all know this one. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All we're doing here is establishing the fact that there's a Godhead that God set up. John 5.19, then, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do, for what things soever He doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Now I'm going to read out of here, and these are magnifiers. I want to read this out of the Amplified Version. John 5, 19 and 20. Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for the things soever he doeth also... I'm reading out of the King James here. I got the King James and the Amplified. So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself of his own accord, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever things the Father does, the Son, in His turn, also does in the same way. For the Father dearly loves the Son and shows Him everything that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will be filled with wonder. And I just wanted to read that because it clarifies it as to the vernacular on the way that English comes through. The whole thing comes down to that Yeshua was listening to what the Father was telling him to do, and he was doing nothing unless he saw the Father doing it, and then he would turn around and wait, and then when it came to his turn, he would do it at the appropriate time. Is that a set some order? Absolutely it's set in some order. John five or John eight twenty five. Then he said unto them, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I saith unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood, not that he spake to them of the Father. Then when Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, 
And ye do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, and the Father hath not let, left me alone. For I do always those things that pleases him. All those things that please him. Why? Because that's the way that the Father was doing things. And if we just do the things the way that the Father was doing it, if we just do the way things the way that Yeshua was doing it, we'll be Father pleasers because that's what He was all about. But again, He was following His Father's order. Jesus Christ was following God's orders. And this whole thing right here with this set of Scriptures here, it points out the order of command from the Father right there to the Son. And then we have to jump down to the next one, is what? The Holy Ghost. Luke 24, 46 to 49. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. But you can see there, right there, in 49, the Father was sending messages through Yeshua to the Holy Ghost. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with high power from on high. Again, the chain of command is still in place. The chain of command was what? The Father to the Son. John 16, 7. John 16, 7. Let's jump over to the Amplified again. 16, 7, and at the bottom of this page it goes to 15, and we're going to go past that. Philip answered. Six, I'm in 6, 7. We have to go to 16. Sixteen seven. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Comforter, the Advocate, the Intercessor, the Counselor, the Strengthener, stand by, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close friends, uh, fellowship with you. And He, when He comes, will convince convict the world about the guilt of sin, the need for a Savior, and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message, about righteousness, personal integrity, and godly character, because I'm, I am going to my Father and you will no longer see me, about judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged and condemned." I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them now. But when He, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth, full and complete truth. Well, He will not speak on His own initiative, but He will speak whatever He hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and He will disclose to you what is to come for the future. He will glorify and honor me because He, the Holy Spirit, will take from me what is mine and, I, and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Because of this, I said that He, the, the Spirit, will take from what is mine and will reveal it to you. We've got to see how far we're going to go with this. One more verse. A little while and you will no longer see me again, and a little while you will see me. So what? Yeshua is saying the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, would not come and what? Speak of Himself. He would not speak of Himself. He's not going to say whatever He wants, but whatever Yeshua told Him to speak. You see, that's how we can establish and we can see that the Godhead is set in order. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And God set up the heavens, and one of the first things that He ever did was set up 
the heavens. He set up the structure in order for it to work properly. And that's what we've got to participate into. And how do we participate in, into that? Well, now we're going to get into the things of the role of the fivefold ministry. And you say, well, I'm not fivefold ministry. Well, first of all, you probably don't know that, yes or no. And second of all, there's the thing called ministry of helps that we can all be part of because that's what we are. We are to be what? Helping the Father on the face of this earth to participate in His army to get the things done, to defeat darkness on the face of this earth. But we have to understand first that God's got an order. God's got an order. And He's got an order that He wanted the church to run by even after Jesus Christ Himself left the face of this earth. Acts 1.5 For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. Huh. You see, one thing we've got to realize is that God has always used man. And that's a bad terminology because people get their eyes on a man. God has always used offices to lead His people. He's always used offices to lead His people the way that He set this thing up and structured it. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that, thou, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You see, Peter was commissioned. And Peter had a commission. And we're going to get into this thing about Peter in a, in a little bit over, over the next few weeks. About Peter's approach to the whole thing. And how, how Peter approached, how Peter looked at the whole thing. Let's jump down to John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest me now more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, I knowest, thou knowest I love thee. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? He said, You know I love you. He said, Feed my sheep. John, John 21, 17, He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Hey, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, just go out there and feed them all. Would you help feed the flock? Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? And isn't that what Peter was pushing as he walked the face of this earth? If you look at some of the things that Peter was, went through, Peter was what told to feed the lambs, the sheep. And nobody else is told to do this, but this is the commission of spreading the gospel, is feeding and feeding and feeding people. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. Acts 2.14, but Peter standing up with the eleven. We're going to look at Peter here for a little bit. Lift up his voice and say unto them, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Another example. We see Peter here kind of taking the leadership role a little bit, don't we? Is it a leadership role, or is it something that we're all supposed to emulate? When you're in a room of people and you're the one that's knowing first fruits, if you're the first fruit in the room, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to stand up, and you're going to have to explain to people exactly what God wants. You see, if you look at Peter, and the way Peter led, if you look at the... Go, you go study the... the five, I'll give them to you here in a second. If you study out the, the five speeches in the book of Acts that Peter gave, the first was just after Pentecost in Acts uh, 2, 14 to 39. The second speech was about the, the temple beggar, and that's in Acts 3, 11. And then he's got one after his arrest. He's got a nice speech, and that's in Acts 4. And then after his second arrest in Acts 5, 29. And then at the home of Cornelius, he's got another one. Acts 10, 34. But if you look at the way Peter went about it, and if you look and study Peter... 
You'll never see Peter just jumping up and down and I'm the leader and telling people what to do. You know, you never saw Peter giving instructions to the other guys either. Why? Because they were apostles. And in all reality, they were prophets if you look and actually see what they did. But Peter's not giving them the instructions because they get their instructions from the Father. That's the way it works. Father, Son, Holy Ghost to the fivefold ministry. And God's got ways that He does that. You see, there's five, there's five common themes within those five things that Peter uh, did there in the book of Acts. Every time that he went through his speech, he had an introduction to his audience. He had an introduction. He had a statement that the audience had, what? Killed Jesus. You guys killed him, but hey, he's dead. Well, yeah, he had to. Because he's preaching the doctrine of a risen Christ. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is how Peter led. This is how Peter led. The third one, the five common things that went with all these. A statement that God has, has the last word by raising him from the dead. The fourth point, it's a statement that Jesus has been exalted and is the coming judge. And we all know that. But he goes through it over and over and over because he knew what he was commissioned to do was to bring the doctrine to the four corners of the earth. The testimony of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God, which they were already keeping long before. And everybody says they got rid of them. No, they didn't get rid of the law. And the fifth one, always the statement, now is time to repent. Put your full trust in, in Jesus Christ. Put your full trust in, in Yeshua. Because that's part of the process. Accept Him as your Savior. This is what He was pushing. Very simple. It's very simple. But again, confusion. Confusion has come. Confusion is abound around the world. It's a very simple doctrine that Peter went through. And it's all because of what? So they could have forgiveness of sin, have eternal life, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, get plugged into the power source of God, and that's what he did. That's what he did. You know, if you look at Peter and the way that Peter led, Peter didn't walk around as a prophet, banging on tables and banging on people's heads, telling people what to do. You don't see that out of this Peter. What you see is Peter coming as an evangelist. Because the, the prophets will walk in all five offices of the fivefold ministry. And you see Peter leading more through the office of evangelist, confessing the name, going out there, giving these great speeches that he had. You didn't see him start off like that after he denied Jesus Christ three times. No, you didn't see Moses start off like that either. Moses what, went to God and said, I stutter, I stutter, I stutter, uh, uh, uh. And then actually, you know, a few chapters later, you see Moses giving these great speeches as well. It's about the anointing of God within their lives. The anointing to have that leadership within them. You see, what can we learn from the content of these speeches? And you have to go back and read them. I'm not going to take the time to read all, the, all these speeches. It would take me another hour. You see, Peter knew about the death. Peter knew about the resurrection. He knew about, of a person called Jesus Christ. And he knew about a person of, called Jesus Christ in the context of the Old Testament, not the context of what we've been taught in the New Testament. He knew about Him in the Old Testament. And that's where we've fallen and that's where we've lacked, that we can't even identify Yeshua in the Old Testament and He's all the way through it. You see, He didn't hide anything, did He? Peter went out there, he professed it, and he professed that the judge is coming, the judge is coming, the judge is coming, the judge is returning to the face of the earth. And I'm here to tell you, the judge is coming back to the face of the earth. He's coming back. What are you going to do? Well, I wanted to do it my way. You know what? Again, there's that Cain spirit. Just do it my way. I'll bring it to God the way that I want to bring it to God. I'll serve God the way that I want to serve God, not the way that God demands it to be done. And what will happen? You'll be judged by the judge that's coming back. 
You see, we have faith. You have repentance. You have the remission of sin. It's all tied together and bundled up into this thing that we call a walk. And this is what Peter was bringing forth. And Peter stood up, and whenever Peter had an audience, this is what Peter pushed. You didn't see him beating people. You didn't see him telling people what to do. You didn't see him commanding other prophets. Why? Because Peter sat on the council with them. He sat on the council with them. And that's how Peter led. And the next thing you know, what did you see? Peter's shadow touches somebody and they're healed and he doesn't even break stride. All because of what? Because of the anointing that he has built within his life. And you can do that. And that's what you've got to do, is bring it to the four corners of the earth. But we've got to ask some of the questions. Again, what could we possibly learn in this modern day from what Peter was going through? And what Peter went through? The humility that Peter had to go through so that he could be who he was. One thing with Peter, Peter was absolutely committed. He was absolutely committed to his commission. But commitment seems to be quite far from the holy places because there's a huge lack of commitment towards the people from the ministry and ministers around the face of this earth. And then we expect those same people to be committed back to the ministry and to the church. And it can't work. Because the process of God that you've got to apply there, you give and then they can give back. And that's why you have to be committed within whatever it is that you have to do with your commission. You have to be committed to it for it to grow. You have to be what willing to give. You have to be willing to go that extra step so that people will take that extra step for you. We served before we ever started doing this. We served. And then it was time to go forth when the release came. Go forth and bring it to the four corners of the earth. And this is what we're doing. We are bringing it to the four corners of the earth. Yerbakoid. And we look at through the Scripture too, and you'll see the Father, and the Father's relationship with the Son. Because even for God to demand something out of people, He already does it Himself. We see that the Father was committed to the Son before the Son could even be committed to the Father. Because He had to know that His Father was with Him. He had to know that His Father was going to do all for Him. And that's what people have to realize out of you. Are you fully committed to the things of the Father? Are you fully committed to the things of God? Is the church out here committed to fully to the things of God? What are they willing to do to get committed to the things of the Father? Are they willing to change? Are they willing, willing to change their structure? Well, that might hurt a little bit, eh? Well, it'll be all right. But ministry has grossly failed. Has grossly failed people over the years. And that's sad. Because that's the one thing that they should be able to rely on in this world. You have got to have integrity. You have got to have integrity to be relied upon. You've got to be reliable, consistent. Whatever that so be. You do the same thing over and over and over, whatever it be. Make sure that you keep that and maintain that and do not allow yourselves to become defiled or your ministry within your life to become defiled. And then we have some other people out here saying, oh, you know what? Nobody's going to teach me but the Holy Ghost. Again, you can't just take a piece of Scripture, weaponize it and turn around and use it 
It's used out of context, and that's what happens most of the time because people really don't know their Bibles, including ministry. And some people are just absolutely in, in rebellion. And you're going to, people that are going to listen to this, they're going to have to make some choices. Are you going to be in rebellion against the things of the Father? Are you going to pick up the phone or send us an email or go to our webpage and contact us and say, uh, help, uh, what do I do? Uh, I've got a ministry over here. I've got a church of 100 people. Uh, what, what am I going to do? Call us. You're not going to be out of a job. But God has an authority that He wants from the th- given from the throne room. It's that simple. It's that simple. John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in My name, He shall teach you in all things and bring you to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 13. Let's jump down another verse. Howbeit, when the Spirit of the truth has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear that shall speak, and He will show you things to come. You see, those people there that are saying, what, nobody's going to teach me but the Holy Ghost, their argument is not consistent with the entirety of Scripture. Yes, the Holy Ghost is going to lead you and teach you into all truths. There's no argument. Nobody's trying to argue about that. It's exactly how He's going to get it done. You see, you can't just sit there and just what read your Bible and pray the Lord's going to take you and teach you and... What they're saying is, I, I don't see the need for the fivefold ministry that God has set up over me. I don't, need, I don't see that. I don't need that. And then they get into this, well, I know more than the ministry does anyway. So, Because the pride, the ego, the head knowledge, because we can all read a Bible, we can all remember Scripture, and then people will sit there and just rattle them off and rattle them off. And that's great. But they'll rattle them off out of context. They'll rattle them off to weaponize it. They'll rattle them off to get a conversation deterred away from the truth of the things of God, and they don't even realize that they're doing it. And that's kind of sad. Well, that's really sad. Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And that's including yourself. Stop lying to yourself. Oh, everything's okay with me. Some people it is. A lot of people it's not. There's always improvements that you can make in the Father. There's always things that you're not doing for God that you're supposed to be doing, that you wish you were doing, but you're still not doing it. So get it done. Whatever it be. Don't procrastinate. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. These are warnings. These are warnings because things are sideways. And when you're you're sideways, you'll believe anything that comes along that looks like it's what? Right. For these shall arise, arise false Christ. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. John 10, 10. We all know this one. For the thief cometh, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, we know that darkness is going to try and stop us. You know that darkness is going to try and stop you. You know that darkness is going to try and tempt you. He's going to go to the Father. This is the process. He goes to the Father. He says, hey, uh, see your guy down there? He says, I'd like to uh, tempt him over here. And God says, okay. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to pass it or are you going to fail it? That's your choice. You got God over here cheering for you. You got darkness over here cho- uh, cheering for you. And it's the decisions that you make is what you're going to vote, which side you're going to fall on. You're like walking a tightrope. And they're trying to, sh- and it's, it's it, darkness, they're shaking it. Which side are you going to fall towards? The Father? Are you going to give up? Fall towards darkness? No, I would say stick on the Father's side. Stick on the Father's side. Choose wisely. Choose the Father. Hosea 4.6. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shall be, shall be no priest to me, 
See, and thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget your children. Hosea 4.6, that is a mouthful right there. Now let's reverse that. I'll do this ad lib. My people aren't destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they haven't rejected knowledge. I won't reject you. You shall be priests to me. Seeing that you have remembered the law of thy God, I will remember your children. Wow. That reads a little bit different. But people out here are destroyed for a lack of knowledge into God's Word. They're destroyed for a lack of knowledge how to apply God's work to a practical, everyday walk. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge on the way that God wants things set up according to His Word, His written Word that He's got in front of us. The examples, the examples that He's laid out there. Destroyed for it. Is that sad? Not really. Get over it. We're the generation that gets to fix it. We're the generation that gets to fix it. God's been in control the entire time. He's the one that drove us to the four corners of the earth. How did that ever happen? Did somebody get out there and scream and yell and say, get out of here? No, it just happened. Things happen. God brought things in place. And guess what? God will bring things in place to drive everybody back again, too. He drive everybody back again, too. Through what? His ways. Do I know? Not yet. Am I seeking His face on it? Yep. How are you going to do it, Father? Show me. You see, but the thing is, is that divine order has got to be followed. Because without it, His people can't be blessed. His people cannot be blessed. The family can't be blessed. The church can't be blessed. The military can't be blessed. The government can't be blessed outside of God's order. And let me tell you, the military is not going to get things in God's order. Because if I was running the military, this thing would be over a long time ago. There'd be no multi-billion dollar wars. There is no politically correct in war. When did that start? I don't see that in the Scriptures anywhere. War is war. When it's time to pick up the sword and to fight, you have to pick up the sword and you fight. There's good and there's bad. That's it. But we have political wars now. They're political wars. But it's divine divine order. But that's where the church is at right now. They're out of order. And when you're out of order, you're out of sync with God. You see, realize that we're not blessed from the Father just because we become Christians. You know, that's the one thing that's free. You become a Christian, that's a free, that's a free gift that He has given out for everybody. That and the infillment of the Holy Ghost is free. Free for anybody. It doesn't come with protection. No, the protection comes what? Because you keep the law, not because you call yourself a Christian. And divine protection comes from those who are serving God, the fivefold ministry, and finally, the eldership. Because those are the heads that God has set over His people. And then it gets down into those who are keeping the covenant, keeping Shabbat, New moon, the festivals, praying, fasting, studying the Word. You want to have a good walk? This is what Peter was talking about. This is what Peter was preaching. This is the doctrine. This is the commandment of Jesus Christ right there. I just rattled it off to you. But be committed to it. And be committed to it as Yeshua was committed to it. Not pleading the blood of Jesus over here and all this other stuff when it gets into tight times. That doesn't work. That is not scriptural. That's not what the blood was shed for. The blood wasn't shed for your protection. It was shed for you to have eternal life and cash your ticket in after you leave the face of this earth. What are you going to do between the time you're born until the time you leave? 
Well, serve God, the fivefold ministry, the eldership. Keep the covenant, which includes the Sabbaths, new moons, festivals. Fast, pray, and study the Word of God. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. I'm going to save the rest for next week. We're going to get into more of the, start off at Ephesians 4.11 next week, as we get into the, a little bit more into the fivefold ministry and where it's derived from. So I want to keep going, but we've gone long enough today. Let's close. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing. We thank you, Father, for how you're moving. And I thank you for showing your approval, Father, in the middle of service. In Yeshua's name we pray, bless these people. Bless these people. Throughout their week, in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.